today on this old house. There is no way we're gonna throw away this beautiful old cast iron radiant baseboard. There's nothing wrong with these doors, so they're gonna end up on a new project instead of a dumpster. What is it gonna take me to get in this machine and have you show me around? What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. It's five bathrooms, it's a kitchen, it's a full new mechanical. It's, it's going to be a big one. Sounds like you guys have a plan. I think we do. <laughs> the money's in the detail. That is beautiful. I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house where we're working on an old home built in the 1880s in this small New England town. Small towns have always played an outsized role in American history. Think Appomattox where the Civil War ended or Sutter's Mill where a gold discovery settled the West. Well this bridge is in another small town and it was here that a group of farmers attacked the most powerful nation on earth and started a revolution. This is the Old North Bridge in Concord, Massachusetts. On April 18, 1775, the British marched here from Boston. They wanted to seize weapons. The farmers were in no mood. Shots were fired, and the American Revolution began. Six years later, the mighty British would be defeated. This bridge and Concord, Massachusetts would forever be linked to American patriotism. I think the town's consciousness of its own history literally did start on that day. Concord was basically an agricultural town, fairly conservative as far as jumping into the revolution, and the Provincial Congress starts to meet here. John Hancock is president of the Provincial Congress, uh, and uh, it, it's a sort of shadow government that was formed, and the important thing they did was to stop paying the taxes to um, to the um, official government and start collecting them themselves. And the first thing they did with those taxes was to begin to assemble uh, materiel, arms and equipment uh, for an army of 15,000. So in April 75, the British know they need to get here. You bet. Because this is where the arms are? Yep, tons. Everything you can imagine, tents, um, rice, gunpowder, musket balls, cannonballs. There at the bridge, you had 450 provincial troops from four or five different towns, and their orders were pretty explicit. Don't, don't fire unless you're fired on. They were fired on at the bridge. That's the shot heard around the world, and that did catch on. There are other big names you know, long after revolutionary actions that are associated with Concord. And in my mind, the association is literary. Who are those people? Well, there's Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's a young man, and they know his name in London. They know his name in Paris. And his protege, Henry Thoreau. Interestingly, Emerson wrote about the North Bridge significantly once, on one occasion. Thoreau writes about it all the time. Louisa May Alcott is uh, a Concord writer, unquestionably the best-selling Concord writer, and Doris Kearns Goodwin, of course. And I think of Doris Kearns Goodwin as, you know, your uh, contemporary literary giant, and she has made her career writing about history. Absolutely. And Lincoln, and th those important events of the Civil War. Over and over and over again, the reason they are here is specifically because it's Concord. Mm -hmm. uh, you, could, you could live in another community around here, but Concord has this, has this thing. It's that history, or maybe it's even not quite as complicated as that. Maybe it's that look of the history. All right, we're here in the part of the house that was the family room. Now this part of the house was probably built in the 80s, and we're gonna take it down to make new room for the uh, new living room, family room, and a master suite upstairs. But because it was built in the 80s, a lot of this material in here is really in good shape. For example, look at this floor. The homeowner doesn't wanna throw all this stuff out. They wanna repurpose it or sell it or give it to somebody that can really use it. So if you look at this floor and you take your time and take the floor up, you get some beautiful flooring, lay it down, it'll be like brand new. 
The hardest part about taking the flooring up is getting the nails out. Let me show you. If you take the floor up, the nails come with it. You take a hammer and now you got to bang that nail out. So you got to take it, a couple of bangs, three or four bangs, you got to get it out. Go over here, you get another one, find another one. Sometimes the nail gets stuck in there. A lot of time to get that in, then I got to pull it out. But there's a tool that can make it a lot easier to get those nails out, and let me show you. It's a pneumatic tool right here, and all it is is an opening at the bottom with a hammer that dries down with a shot, with one shot. Boom. All right? So you take that, bring it over the, to a barrel, put some cardboard on the bottom of the barrel, put this over the nail, you pull the trigger, and look at that. The nail's gone, and the board is just like new and it's shot right into the cardboard so it doesn't bounce back at you. Now this room in here was the dining room. We're gonna save as much of this stuff as we can because this room's coming off. Yeah, and we're gonna save all this uh, cast iron baseboard. You know, this looks like a baseboard, but it's actually a radiator sort of stretched out. Yeah, I love this it stuff. It gives beautiful, I grew, up, I grew up with it in my house and it was great because you could bump into it. It's really durable. It gives you radiant heat into the room like a radiator does, but it also works by convection where cooler air is drawn into the bottom, gets heated on the back side of the cast iron, and then heated air comes out through here. Right. Now it comes in sections. If you look carefully, you can see here's about a one foot section. It's going to be one foot, two foot, and 18 inch. And we're going to take this cast iron baseboard and repurpose it in that other part of the building that has the copper fin baseboard. Yeah. Get rid of that. So we may have to reconfigure it in different lengths, but right. let's start by getting rid of it. First thing is you want to drain the heating system, which we've done. <laughs> That's always a plus. All right, well, why don't we get this end cap off? There's a All little, right. just, yep, if you can I loosen that nut there. Good. Oh, there it comes. Yeah, there it is. It's been there about 80 years. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you can see there's a union connection right here, and if we were going to reuse this piping, I'd take, I'd take a, a wrench to loosen it, but we don't need to. In the old days, I would do this to cut it away, but why would we do that? Yeah. We got tools, right? There you go. Are you sure we drained it? Nice. Okay, good. Now the other end. So here's how they connect in a corner. We may want to reuse these in the other room, so I'm going to do this a little more delicately. You can see there's a place for a screw in each one of the sections. Yep. So let's just loosen all them. Okay. There's an air vent here. I'm just going to remove that so we can stack these onto each other. Watch your fingers. Oh, yeah. This, this is usually when the homeowner goes, oh, I can't believe how dirty I left it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but you can see the skeleton of it now. Here's this individual sections. Yeah. And they're held together by a single nut and bolt right here. And what you don't see are there are steel push nipples right here that get compressed. So what we're going to do is take apart these sections. There. Not much to that. So now that's out. So now we want to try and pry this apart carefully. Okay. Okay. So there you can see it. These are the steel push nipples, no threads. Yep. And a little bit of pipe compound. When we put it back together again, that'll make a nice watertight seal. Okay. Good. So we got these in more manageable sizes. I can handle all the rest of it. All right. I'm going to go give Charlie a hand with some more demo. All right. Radiators aren't the only thing we repurpose. These hardwood floors look good, so a nonprofit called Green Goat is carefully taking them up for resale. The appliances are in good shape, so our homeowners are going to ship them to a family that needs them in Haiti. All right, more things to salvage. These doors look in pretty good shape. They do, they still operate perfectly? Yeah. They're a vinyl clad door, insulated glass. 
All right, so let's get going. I'll give you a hand. By the other door. Good find though. Oh yeah. It wasn't on the plan, but Megan and Lincoln, we were doing a walkthrough and they said, hey, can we open up this stairway really to duplicate this side, and really open up the space? Yeah, make a big difference because this is a narrow and a small stairway. So what do they want to go about here? Yes. All right, so that's a little under eight feet right there. So we've definitely got to open it up and see if this beam right here that's lower than the ceiling is long enough to support all of the weight. Now the joists are running in this direction. And I know that because if I look at the floor right here, the rough boards are running this way. And because of the nail pattern, you can see the joists are running this way. Because this house had an addition put on it. And I believe the original house stopped here. There was an addition added, I believe in about the 80s. On this side, on the back, and in the back of the room over there. So let's get this open up and see what we got. Great. Wire All right, so this is a demolition blade, and if we were cutting wallboard or drywall, we could probably use this for an hour. But because of the makeup of the ceiling and the thickness of the plaster, along with the wire lath, we're eating these blades right up. Was it uh, framed like you thought? Yeah, looks like it. All right, so I've got the joists coming from that side, resting on top of this beam here, and these joists going this way, resting on the beam. So it looks like that this beam is probably only, uh, it looks like a four by six beam right here. So we can open this up and go eight feet easily by flush framing it. We'll insert it into the lapping joist. Cut them, slide it up, put hangers on. It work perfect. Piece of cake. This is an eastern hemlock tree, and it's located directly between the house and where the homeowners want their fire pit. They love this tree, and they're going to do everything they can to protect it. Hemlocks are native to America, and they're one of the few conifers that like shade. But recently, hemlocks have been under assault by a non-native bug called the woolly adelgid, and it's killing them all up and down the East Coast. And we have arborist Josh Fritz here today to make sure that doesn't happen to our tree. How are you doing, Jen? Good, how are you? Good. Excellent, so what have you found? I'm not really seeing the adelgid yet on this tree. Mm -hmm. um, I am seeing some uh, defects on the canopy. Mm -hmm. So I you know, suggest to put some cabling in there to support that uh, defect. Other but that, overall, it looks pretty good. yeah, this health looks great. Yeah. I mean, let's check out the needles over here. Sure. And you can show me how we could locate, yeah, like yeah. what is the woolly adelgid. Okay. This is a perfect example of a uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Yes. You can see all the little white fuzz all over the stem of the needles right there. Yeah. You can see how the needles are starting to yellow. So those uh, in insects are actually pulling out all the chlorophyll in the needle. They're just decimating yes. it and destroying yes. it's it. Yes, causing those needles to drop. So you see like one egg sac, how many, how many insects in There's at one least sac? a thousand in those insects. So you're telling me one of these white little puffy balls has thousands in them? Correct. 
Yeah. All right, so how, how are we gonna how are we gonna get rid of these guys? Basically, I'm gonna use horticultural oil. Okay. Uh, it's gonna what it does is it actually dries them out. Suffocates it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it takes multiple applications to get it controlled. So yep. yeah, this little white fuzz is gonna stay on the tree probably a year or two, right. and it'll naturally drop off. So maybe so. two treatments a year. They're, yeah, you have to do it in the cold weather, right? Yeah, yeah. You do uh, ideally do it early in the spring because mm -hmm. they are active. Mm -hmm. Um, you also come back in the fall because they're uh, active then. In the summer, they're kind of dormant. There's, it's a cool season insect, so it doesn't really want to hang out during the hot summers. Right. You want to show me how you're going to spray it? Sure. Josh is spraying mineral oil, so he doesn't need to wear a respirator. And can you tell me what percentage of the oil there is? Sure, it's a 2% oil. So it's a 2% oil, the rest of it's water. It's great that it's safe, and we thank you for coming out because this Not is such problem. an important thing yeah, to do. Yeah, just let it dry in about a half hour, and you can have a picnic right underneath. Perfect, tree. perfect. Right? I'd like to hear that. All right. Hey, Charlie. Kevin. So we're at the stage where some stuff's not getting saved, right? What's the plan? Well, we're going to take down this 80s addition in garage because the new plan calls for a different footprint of the garage, has a master above it. So believe it or not, it's going to be really cheaper to take this down instead of, instead of you know, working with what we have and building onto it. So original house, two stories right there, this whole one story. That's the addition, 80s, right. no good, coming off. Coming off, and we're gonna use the excavator here. It's got a special thumb on the end of the bucket. Yeah. It's gonna literally just squeeze in there, grab if it was your hand, yep. crush it up, the little pieces, and then put it in the dumpster and pack it in. That's gonna be fun, okay. Yeah. Before we do that, we have a special saw that we're gonna cut the 80s addition right through the roof, right around the other side, so when he grabs it with the machine, he doesn't hurt the original part of the house that we're gonna save. A little bit of surgery, huh? It is. Check this out. Hey, hey guys. All right, so this is the saw we're gonna use right here. This is a gasoline-powered uh, cutoff saw. You see it a lot in landscaping. Landscapers use it to cut things like the slate, also brickwork when they're doing patios, concrete, all kinds of things. Now this is a two-stroke, means you mix the gas uh, and oil with it together. Uh, you can get these in electric, you can get them in hydraulic, you can get it bigger and smaller also. But it's all in the blade that you use right here. This demolition blade right here will cut through everything on the roof. All right, we've cut away as much as we possibly need to right now. The machine can do the rest. Yeah, the house is safe and the fun begins now. This is a small to mid-size excavator, about 32,000 pounds, only 110 horsepower, but it's really about the hydraulics and that arm right there a lot of strength and a lot of reach. Could reach out 27 feet, and if you want it, could dig a 20-foot hole. It's got a bomb at the end of the arm, but there's a quick coupler, which means you could pop the thumb off, put on a whole bunch of different attachments a little later on, 
They're going to put on a hydraulic hammer and start busting up the concrete. And Bob, what is it going to take me to get in this machine and you're, have you show me around? You're here right now. I'll show you. <laughs> you got no choice. I'm in your face. All right. So this, uh, again, is the hydraulic. It, invo it, it starts the hydraulic system. That's okay? engaged. Engaged. Over here is your throttle. All right. This lever right here is boom up, pull back to me, boom up, go this way, bucket, this runs the bucket. So you got the bucket and the boom on the same lever, all right? This here runs the crowd, the crowd. which is, is, the, is the stick from the top of the boom to the bucket. Yeah. That's the crowd. And this is the swing lever. Swing it this way, you swing this way, swing it the other way, you swing the other way. What could go wrong? <laughs> You look like you've been on it forever. Thank you. Made short work of that, and look at that cut along the building. It was nice and neat. Even the windows are still intact. Surgical, Charlie. It was. Now this after finishing crushing this up, load the dumpster, start taking out the old foundation, prepping for the new, and then we're ready to go. All right. And then next week we're going to take that wall down the one side of the front staircase, recess the beam that these guys found today. And Jen's going to have her first look at the new landscape plan. So until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Tom Silva. I'm Charlie Silva. This old house here in Concord. Charlie, you guys good, but how about me at the controls, oh, huh? Please. Get back in the seat, come on. You'd still be in that corner. Sign me up, me? I'm going in. Yeah. <laughs> Next time on This Old House. The homeowners have an elaborate plan for the landscape in front and back. You want to show me what you guys have come up with so far? We started at the front of this property mm -hmm. to give it an elegant sense of enclosure. Old renovations have left the foundation a mess, so we're going to clean them up. Take a couple passes at it, make it through in like five minutes, maybe ten. And when a bearing wall comes down, a beam has to go up. And that's the project for today.